gosh. So do you have your new poetry book here? No. Yeah, I do. There's one over there on the counter. Uh, let's get it and put, put some... Uh, oh. I put my glasses back on? Or if yeah. I fall down walking across the room. This... Where are you going now? Oh, I was... You following me around? What do you want me? Where do you want me? There's the poetry book. There's okay. the book. So, you are talk over here. I'll go back over here. Okay. <clears throat> Book of poetry book here. The hot seat. Eh? Hot seat. Haji Baba. I'll just read the news to you like I was uh, uh, Stephen Colbert or something. Earlier this month, Mount Sinabong in North Sumatra province erupted as authorities were allowing thousands of villagers who had been evacuated to return to its slopes, killing 16 people. Sinabong has been erupting for four months, forcing the evacuation of more than 30,000 people. Well, Mount Kalud, which is the new eruption, displaced 100,000 people, but has so far only killed three, as far as I know. But, I mean, these Indonesian volcanoes, ladies and gentlemen, are going to be the cure, let's say, for global warming. By the time, I mean, Mount Toba, 73,000 years ago, caused an ice age that lasted for a thousand years. The next big... Indonesian volcano will probably do the same and it might be Yellowstone National Park. It could be in Latin America. It could be anywhere. The volcanoes tend to chill people out. You know, I mean, it's going to make global warming look like Rush Limbaugh pissing in a tin cup. He's not going to, <laughs> not going to make any difference anymore, Russ. All of the trouble you've caused with global warming is gone now, along with your radio program and everything with it. You know, your boss, Roger Ailes, your pal, Bill Riley, Hannity, Combs, the whole Fox and Fox boatload is going down, uh, and it's going to come straight out of the earth. Hot lava, ash, smoke, and more gas than you've had since Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, this is the first poem in the book, The Source. It's called A New Mayan Letter for Joshua and Jeremy. South of the border, the many borders, where rich Texas Cubans will erect walls for the poor to fly over on their way to heaven, though it may not be as heavenly as his proponents take pains to point out. It's been a long time since I was young, driven apparently to excess by roads that stopped at the water's edge, the border crossings, burying the failures of bureaucracy. Get old or die are the only choices. But living beyond the means, act young, get real, make good second choices. The American dream is rattling the sheets of a population asleep in it. Without a frame, the picture goes on forever. Like this forever. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> nice. We'll read the last one. Oh, well, the first poem and the last one. That, that, <laughs> that makes sense. We're going to box this. That was a good choice. I mean, a good suggestion. <clears throat> the last poem in the, in the source is called True Lies. True Lies. True Lies. Trail riding in late November up Blue Creek and on Clicker Mountain. The weather has the good sense to rain at night. By the time I learned what I need to know, it was too late to apply it. When I touch brandy and four mile on the nose, my heart falls through my feet toward the center of the earth. I treat my horses as if I were a Comanche Indian, as members of the family, in other words. I am staggered by the beauty of the sun. Nice. What happened then? I lived in Fukuoka for a year, uh, almost 20 years ago, in the village of Mainohama, which is a suburb of Fukuoka. And the story was that I needed furniture for a house. I rented a Akiyoshi san's house in Mainohama, and I needed furniture for it. I needed some futons and various things that you need to conduct life. And there was a sayonara sale taking place. Not that far from where we lived, about a mile or so as the bicycle rides through the suburbs of uh, Minohama. 
And the woman having the sayonara sail, so help me God, was from Walla Walla, living in Fukuoka, nearby to my neighborhood. And I got futons and a rice cooker. What else did I get from her? A bunch of stuff. Does she live in Walla Walla now? No, she's gone. But she used to have a, uh, a little coffee shop on the top of the Beehive building where Starbucks now is. When I got back here in 1996, she had a business up there. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 96. She's gone now. I don't know where she is now. Oh. She was a little early for the yuppie rush that's been filling up Walla Walla lately. Yuppie rush? The yuppie rush. <laughs> young, young urban professionals? Wine, wine makers? Wine tasters, wine makers but drifting in from Fran the south of France with yeah. their uh, tasting rooms and their... Uh, uh, I love them, you know, in case anybody's listening to this who's actually in the wine business in Walla Walla. We owe a great deal to Rick Small and Gary Figgins, uh, respectively of Woodward Canyon and Leonetti Cellars, because back in the 70s they started making wine here. When I moved to this town in 1978, there were two wineries here, Leonetti Cellars and Woodward Canyon, and now there are more than a hundred. And the place is borderline famous for wine and getting more famous all the time. And it, we owe it to those two guys. Uh, I mean, they had a huge handle in it, a huge hand in it, not a handle. Yeah. Who's handle, anyway? He was a musician, a Mozartian musician. He may have even preceded Mozart. Yeah, and preceded the Duke. The Duke of Ellington? Well, yeah. but not by much, I'll tell you. Uh, I loved, I read a biography of Duke Ellington recently. What a great man, great musician, great handler of human beings. I don't know if you could, you maybe, have you got editing capacity in here? That's what I'm about to say may not be suitable for YouTube. YouTube? Where are you going with this video? If not YouTube, then where? Walla Walla knows. Walla Walla knows. Oh, go, well, I won't say. I, I'll say something nice about Luke Ellington then. I mean, he, he said that keeping a band together like he did, he said, I do what scientists do in mental institutions. Because you just imagine it. You've got 20 musicians, all independent personalities, all individually talented, all with their minor or major vices and habits like drugs or alcohol or women. And you have to keep them all together and get them at a particular place and get them in tune and playing the same song. Uh, it's complicated, believe me. Uh, and uh, Duke Ellington he had a birthday party. Uh, Richard Nixon threw him a birthday party when he was 70 years old in the White House. Yeah. And Nixon play, sat down, so help me God, Nixon used to play the piano. He sat down and played some Duke Ellington's. Oh, he played Happy Birthday in G uh, for Duke Ellington, and then they just had a party. I mean, can you imagine that? Richard Nixon and Duke Ellington? Living it up at the White House, celebrating Duke Ellington's mastery of the material. I think it's a terrific idea. I mean, it's talk about two great Americans, you know. Two of the greatest Americans. <laughs> no, no, not two of the, <laughs> just two great Americans for different reasons. I mean, Richard Nixon was great because he proved that you can be a, a complete screwball and still become president. But he also, <laughs> he also had the good sense to recognize China. And that began the modern age. It allowed China to, to have some trade with the rest of the world. I mean, if, if you can't trade in the rest of the world, you starve. And after World War II, the Chinese starved for a long time. And it was uh, unnecessary and unfair, unfortunate, criminal. I mean, I could, I could think of a few thousand other pejorative adjectives to put on that. But Richard Nixon saw through all of that baloney. Plus, he was, being, he, was, he was a master in his own mind of real politic. And he thought, I'll go recognize Mao Zedong and put some pressure on Leonard Brezhnev. Ha ha! Brezhnev will never forgive me! Ha ha ha! Kissinger, get on it! <laughs> and so they did. <clears throat> I've been reading, actually, the, the book I've been reading recently is uh, Auden's book about Shakespeare. Auden lectured on Shakespeare. And it was the very important news there about how Shakespeare taught himself to 
learn how to write the kind of language that men of action would speak. Allowed him to write the great tragedies because like earlier he's writing Richard II, which is, Richard II was like a poet. He should never have been king. Uh, and he just, you know, blathers around, you know, I mean, uh, bad, bad writing. But anyway, so uh, that's what I was trying to do there for a second, was trying to get the language of men of action. Like Richard Nixon, explic, explic, expletive, is that what it is? Expletive deleted, uh, the, the tapes, the Richard Nixon tapes. And speaking of tapes, I, I understand that it's the 50th anniversary last fall of the assassination of JFK, and more people by half believe global warming than believe that there, were, that there was only one gunman who, who killed uh, JFK. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so it goes. Yes, yes. It is. It's a long way. It's a long way to the past. Yeah. Can I put in a commercial? I mean, uh, just as long as it's TV? not for Hillary Clinton. It's not. No, it's not for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> it's for my book. It's on behalf of my publisher, oh. Green Pan. This book is is available from Green Panda Press in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, you can Google Green Panda and find them. Uh, the publisher there, his name is Bree, and uh, we need all the readers we can get. You know what I mean? You know, because we're living in this sea of uh, ignorance in the United States, and uh, we need to, like, swim to the shore and uh, carry carry some good news with us. Hallelujah! Okay. Hallelujah, brother! That's good! Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you. We'll catch you later.